I thought, what better way to start off a new patch than with basically just a new sub-series because, I don't know, I just randomly noticed this. I was like, this seems like a good idea. It's Pub Best of Freeze. That's right. We are about to check out a series between Give You Anxiety and David Kim that happened in the pub matchmaking. They basically got each other back to back three times in a row and we get a fantastic best of three as we hop into the first map. It is going to be here on King of the Hill. Let's go. I had to remember which scene I was opening up for a set there. Almost went for the AOE4 comp cast and scene, which would have uh, shown some M4C stuff off, which is not what we want. But here we are. We're going to be taking the King of the Hill, and it is going to be France making an appearance with GUA Man. And then put, hold up. What's this on the other side? Oh, nah, nah, that, that's not allowed right there. Hold on a second. We, we, mm, is that allowed? Can anyone confirm or deny whether we're allowed to do this? It is going to be China making an appearance. On King of the Hill of all maps. I mean, this, this, folks, is why we can't just watch tournament games, right? Because no one would have done this. No one, no, I don't think anyone done this. I believe uh, in the M4C qualifiers, even before the, the buffs and the fixes, China was, I believe it was six wins, at least on the second weekend, if I recall correctly. I don't think any of those were on King of the Hill, though, which is why I'm kind of intrigued and excited to see what can, can happen here on this map. Because... It's interesting to think of the potential that this Civ has, especially in regards to like if you can initially wall up. You are going to be under threat early on from the power of French Knights, but it's not an impossible matchup. It's definitely like historically been a French favored matchup. But you know what? Before we even think about that, we got to think about like how these players rank because maybe it's just going to be a wash right now. People are like KP, you, you, you know, you, it could just be an absolute stomp one way or the other. That is true. But both of these players very capable. Of course, Give You Anxiety needs no introduction. We've seen him time and time again. He's currently sitting 99th in the world. Not bad. Respectable. The interesting part is David Kim, who we still don't know if it's a meme account or if it's the real David. I mean, uh, it's hard to tell. Like in fairness, the, the, the thing that has me suspecting it could be the real David is like it's not an unreasonable number of games for a guy at this stage this many months after this like you know got a full-time job as a dev in theory depends how much crunch time he's having to deal with in 2021 2022 but you don't by now I don't know we stopped treating our developers like absolute crap in the game development sphere but he's sitting around 480 games and David Kim right now is 42nd in the world what are I it could be a smurf we said this already is, is there's a high likelihood this is probably a smurf but I can't find the person. So if you have seen him, all right, I know they say snitches get stitches, but snitches get smiley faces here. Admittedly, it's probably going to be like stitches type because it's going to be like a joker smiley face if you're in prison, but we're not in prison. So, and if I for some reason have people watching from prison, hello, welcome to the channel. So let's focus on these openings right now because as it stands, David, nothing too unorthodox. Only two people on the goal to open this one up. When you think about this matchup, it could be one of those unorthodox situations where the Chinese player actually goes for spirits. And I really mean unorthodox. It's not frequent for us to see uh, a Rax get dropped early on in the game by a Chinese player. Usually they just try to, you know, plow through to their power time on their own stables of Lancers, uh, or obviously before that horseman, or they go straight into castle as quickly as possible and look towards the palace guard. But ever since the nerfs around the clock tower, rushing castle isn't isn't as sexy as it once was for these Chinese players. It feels like they've had to kind of, you know, diversify themselves a bit. But there's definitely a lot of power now. Like something to keep in mind is obviously one of the big changes they made is like, you know, China. Uh, in regards to their taxing rates, they're going to be able to go gather gold a lot quicker. So tapping into quicker cast age timings does seem a little bit more feasible for this Civ now. And this ludicrous build speed, by the way. Can you see this, guys, right now? One versus five. One versus five. And although you could say GUA has a clear edge in terms of the build speed, does he really? Because it, it feels to me like maybe GUA's bar is moving slightly quicker here. Slightly, like ever so slightly. And this is such a big deal for the Chinese, actually. Like, this is why they have to be very careful about how they tweak them and balance them. Because right now, you know, you can say, oh, dog tier is here. But in the blink of an eye, they've become dominant because of this build speed more than anything else, right? If you think about early game impact right now, GUA just invested five villages, four more than that of David Kim to maybe get like a 20 second, 25 second lead on this tech up. And I do believe David started his late as well, if I recall correctly. Like GUA was about a fifth of the way, a quarter of the way through. So that kind of gives you like a, an idea of how powerful this tool can be for the Chinese. And it's going to be the Rax as expected. And this Rax is unlocked so much quicker because he has four people who aren't building him up to feudal age. 
they're busy gathering on the wood line, the gold line, the food line. And what that also does, that then unlocks these pricey Imperial officials a little bit quicker, which then inflate your economy further with a 20% additional drop off when they supervise these buildings. It's all that kind of ripple effect, right? It's like that, that push through of like this uh, into that, into the, the daisy chain effect that you get from the early game economy for China is phenomenal. And now with Supervised being correct, if he needs to rush into Spearman when he sees a lot of knights coming, he can do so. And that's another cool thing about China up against the French is that you are able to accelerate your defense force. Whereas there's a lot of sieves that they build the racks at this timing, the knights will be riding in and they would only have maybe one, possibly two Spearmen out and wouldn't be able to protect their lines. But I like the way that he's done this. This is actually really smart from David. So you can see he's already got three spears out. He's protecting his small wood line very efficiently. And you can't go for anything else if you're GUA, right? You, like, he's not in the gold, so that's not ahead of his Barbican son. And behind, like, it's 10 villages. It's 10 villages exactly. David has thought about this. There's only room for 10 people in that Barbican son. So he has immediate protection for his villager force. But it looks like now he's getting a little bit more greedy as he sends additional villagers over to that line. But overall, this is a nice structure in the base. And you have to be careful about the way you do this because one of the really frustrating things is with these wood lines being so shallow, it leaves you very naked. You can see... It's not like when we talk about these fat wood lines here where you kind of, you know, you just take a chunk out of it like you're eating the first bite of a donut, right? Instead, it's more like you're cutting the pie in half and you're giving half away because you're not able to make this, this crescent, this crescent defense that pushes into the wood line and doesn't expose you to knights. Instead, you always have to be prepped on each side because you're always chipping away at the outskirts immediately. So while we've been focused on his base, it's probably a good time to check on what Geo's doing. Looks like he has gone for the archer range, already pushing the archers forward. But remember, that stable was already dropped. And David, oh, he's gone for pro scouts. Oh, right. Then this is, I don't remember last time I saw a Chinese player do this. I mean, it's, it's, it's weird when you think about it. A lot of the maps we've seen China whipped out on, I think one that comes to mind for me clearly would be something along the lines of Altai. You, know, you, you don't necessarily need it because the initial deer are close by. Or China, we've been seeing it a little bit on Hill and Dale. Once again, deer are close by. But in this situation, this is a viable way to deny your opponent uh, equity while also getting your own returns, right? Because you know that the French player, he could be going for pro scouts. But... Because he's a French player, he won't go pro scouts. Instead, what he'll want to do is move out onto these greedy eco pockets on the deer lines forward of his base. And over time, David will get access to that and he'll be able to snatch that away. It's a really cool idea. Because for him right now, he wants to play a condensed economy. He knows he's going to be under fire. Like, when you're up against France's matchup, your job is just to survive. It's actually really smart. We'll see how well it can pay off. One of the dangerous points in the game for David is going to come in a few minutes when this wood line depletes. That's when he has to shift attention. The problem he has is this, this generation is not generous, right? There's a lot of open ground. Someone like, someone at the uh, the office is like, David, I know that name. He works for another RTS uh, developer. We hate him. We hate him for he is the enemy. He's the competition. So we've coded in a special, if David Kim is in game, give bollocks generations to him. And make sure he gets bollocked for it. Because this really is the type of one where you can get roughed up. But so far, not able to find that big impact. But Archer's now showing up. That's going to force David back. Now, David, he can switch over to the Horseman. He isn't supervising just yet. But he's already got three out in the field. So this is a little bit of a dicey situation for GUA. Remember what we said about this weirdness to this composition. Spearmen and Horsemen are phenomenally effective right now against the tried and true classic of Cavalry plus Archers. Because it's just impossible. Like, when you're trying to, like, min-max, click the right unit, and they're all charging in, you can get caught off guard. Your knights, they have to peel off because of all the bonus damage from the spears. And it, it just becomes frustrating to try and protect your archers. Nice strike under one of the scouts in the meantime. The problem is David just has too many of these. And he's getting plenty of food. And the other, uh, the other knock-on factor of this, right, is that he's condensing his economy to one location, all food-wise. Which means that he can just keep plowing people in. You can see right now he's got 24 villagers. Get more farm than China, I dare you. Right now, this one Imperial official is overseeing increased production on all this because the berry bushes and then the deer is being dropped off. It's all about min-maxing this location. And that is really one of the big, delicate balances of playing the Chinese, right? It's like, how do I use these Imperial officials efficiently? Right? It's not like when you're playing the Delhi, and you're like, I'm a bank of million and one scholars in these buildings. Whoop, whoop. No, you pay double the price in a lot of the cases of what the Delhi do. And then this unit, you can only have four of them. 
right? That, that's one of the frustrating limitations you have to work around. And it, it really does take a long time to master that. In the meantime, though, fight underway. Nice strike again. Uh, was that? That had to have been the scouts. There's no way that would have been villagers. It looks like villagers or spearmen. Would have been surprised if it was even spears, but looks like he buffers him away. And this is the frustrating part about the current meta. Knights really cannot handle horsemen. It sounds wacky, but you can push out so many. It's the cost-effective nature of it. Now, Spearman, need to be careful. This is a mistake by David. He actually peeled his horseman off to the side. He is finding value up against the knights, because remember, the horsemen outrun the knights. But in the meantime, he's sacrificing the center. And he needs more horsemen. He needs them now. And that's why he's supervising. He's going to zoom up that production speed. Seven seconds to push out a horseman. He's going to need probably seven or eight of them to deal with this many archers. We'll give a little bit of ground for the moment. But of course, Barbican Sun's going to protect him. He needs to be careful, the Imperial official. Oh, no. That's, that's a hit. That hurts. So that's going to slow down your production rate. Now, once again, it's not just the fact there's 150 food. Now, to replace that Imperial official, you sacrifice being able to build another villager. That's the frustrating nature of it, similar to the way prelates function in the economy. And horsemen, they are trying to move in. This is what we're talking about. The greed. GUA does move out onto the deer lines. David unable to punish him for it just yet. However, he now knows he's doing it. And this is where David could get aggressive. GUA is either going to have to go in for the jugular or he might have to take a defensive position because horsemen outmass him and they outzoot him, right? They're just quicker. And it means that he can easily just move around and go straight through eco lines. Meanwhile, David, because he's still playing this congested, uh, this, this you know, confined, this compact economy, it's not easy to go in and punish him the same way the French player can be punished. And this is known in the matchups, right? Chinese players do tend to play this kind of style. Like they try and keep it a bit condensed. French players are the other extreme. These guys love to just drag a bunch of villagers and click somewhere else on the map and say, I'm going to get my value because they're all about controlling the flow. This is, I'd say this is the truest example of a tempo controlling sip. Flash, Horseman on Knights. Not really a, a way that David should be taking that fight. Remember, the Horsemen don't get a charge bonus, but the Knights most definitely do. And what I mean by the, this Sif being the, the King of Tempo, by the way, is it's the access to Knights. Like, you can talk about Mongols and what they do early on without post rushes. It's the fact that, like, as a French player, you can actively mobilize around the entire map at the start of Feudal, straight away of Knights. None of a Civ has that capability. You can argue Roost, but it's not the same. They don't get the bonus damage on the charge, which you're now going to see coming into effect as they slaughter a few of the villagers. And the Spearman caught AFK. A lot of damage done, but only one villager falling in the end. So David, definitely going to be able to recover that because he did go into the Imperial Academy. And he's going to the Zhuk Nu now. And this is where it gets a little bit awkward for GUA because he's been outcomped. It's another transition. Horseman, Spearman, and now the Zhuk Nu. All strong counters to what they're targeting, right? You've got the horsemen that will do phenomenal against the uh, against the archers. The Zhugnu will absolutely shred both archers and spearmen. And then, of course, you've got the spearmen to protect against the knights. It's, it's just more powerful for David right now. Zhugnu. Need to be careful because, remember, in small numbers, they don't have the range to combat archers. Charge across. Striking forward. Oh no, the village is trapped in. Big mistake made there by David. Gets caught out. A lot of them dead. Trying to get the straggler trees. And now the butchering continues. GUA now up at 44. Meanwhile, David down at 33 economy units. Zhugnu in the meantime getting rid of the spears. Spearman just trying to juke and jive. In the meantime, though, there's a horseman strike. David Kim went round the back but couldn't get enough damage done here. A few spearmen will scare him away. And mistakes have been made. And after all that, David now clearly behind. He will be able to recover, but he needs to find a way out of this. This hole is getting deeper, and he's just getting dirt shoveled on top of him right now. GUA definitely oppressing him, and it's good posturing. This is what you want to do as France. You can't afford to let up, because look what David's doing. Yes, he got butchered. Yes, it hurt. But look at the numbers. Look what he's prepping for. And that's why his army was so weak, remember? There was only a few Zhugnu coming out. A few more horsemen. He was trying to min-max what he already had to enable what comes next. And that is a lot of villagers moving out. Onto a new wood line. He understands that's the thing that's going to kill him at this rate. He'll send the spears and the Zhugnu over to guard the expansion. Leave barely anything in the main base. In the meantime, horsemen are going to ride in. And they're going to punish the villagers. Big mistake. GUA out of position. Didn't notice it. A few villagers are going to fall. Textiles will protect the rest of them, though. And that's a big difference here. David, after that butchering, will realize the mistake was made. He didn't get textiles. His opponent did. And now his horsemen will be able to shift away. Heavy damage done, though. And David, still trailing, but not for long. Remember, with the Song Dynasty comes that beautiful, juiced up production speed on your villagers. Something that he will use effectively here. 
I can't help but notice that David hasn't really been... Uh, I don't think he's been dragging the taxes back too frequently here, to be honest. Okay, he's done it on the lumber camp, but this mill has... I, I mean, it's a leviathan. It's a that mill right there almost cont contains enough gold itself for a tech up. That is actually insane when you think about it. Especially now that you're able to juice it so much... Uh, like, just milk it so much quicker, right? With the Imperial Examinations increasing that to 80... I mean, you can quickly exhaust this, especially when you're just sitting next door to it. I feel like it's a missed opportunity. David should definitely be going for that tech. Considering he sacrificed his castle age to get a new military force, it's not like he's saving gold, right? So just in investing a small amount, 125 gold, you'll almost instantly get your return. It's definitely worthwhile. Um, back in the base of GUA, how is he looking now? I wouldn't be surprised if he's contemplating a, a tech up soon. But once he gets eyeballs on his opponent, he might rethink that. And the one thing I have to commend both players in this game for is scouting. GUA's always kept a scout with his battalion. He always sees what's coming. He always gets a, a very big notification about it ahead of time. However, this fight, I mean, this, this could completely disrupt the balance. It's very all in from David with this many Zhugnu, but I love this detail. This is so smart. The line formation, it's such an underused tool, folks. It's amazing for Lombos, but it's also amazing for Zhugnu. You have a range deficiency against anything else in this game, right? Like, you could not reach the archers initially. So, the worst thing is if you're in a cluster formation and your backlines take even longer to start firing. This formation means everything is going to open fire at the same time. It's so damn effective and it's so underrated and I'm so happy to see more players using it. I think the first time I saw this was actually back last year. It was with Lombos and I think Iogaz was the main one doing it as England. But so many players still playing Lombos this day don't use it. And now we're going to be presented just how effective it can be with the Chinese you knew. Chinese you knew you need to be a little bit careful. David, he is still floating a lot of food. But his problem right now is he's running out and he needs farmlands. That's why he's so invested in this. The, the berries are keeping him alive for the moment, but he really needs to find a way of getting himself some renewable resources. Fight's going to go underway, though. Spears trying to move through. Only the Knights. Zhugnu need to focus fire onto the right targets. Instead, they're focusing on the Knights. They need to get rid of the Spears and the Archers, but they're not. Horsemen now looking to wrap around to the north side for David. And the night count is falling despite the fact that it's inefficient. The focus fight is effective. With this many Zhuk knew the, uh, the knights are being butchered. Another wraparound. The horsemen around the back distract and the spearmen turn their attention towards it. Zhuk knew almost done with the night line. And then they can deal with the archers. And this is a fight that David will come out ahead of. But he just has too many troops. More of them trying to run across the field from GUA. But because you're fighting a defensive war here, David has the reinforcement rate. And that advantage is going to be king here. As it looks like GUA is going to lose the Royal Army. All the Knights are going to fall. Archers are going to go down as well. And then all of a sudden, David can posture and move forward to the center of the map. And I can't believe this is what... I mean, you know, there, there's some people right now like, Zhugnu against, against France? That's, uh, are you sure about that? That many Zhugnu? Uh, I, I definitely had my reserves about it. But when you come out at the end of the fight and you're still healthy with 30 Zhugnu and your opponent has been butchered, then you feel good. It's the fact that once you reach that critical mass, it doesn't matter that they do such little damage because they can burst the knights instantly. And it's crazy to think about. It's an 80 resource unit compared to a unit three times the cost. If you get enough of them, though, if you turn up to a Zerg factor of 20, which a man from a background in StarCraft would, then it's surprisingly effective, even against the most chunky and premium of units in the Feudal Age. G-Way will fully back up. You see he's paranoid now. Question is, what does David want to do next? Because David is reaching a fragile state soon. He will have to transition into farmlands, and that could leave him a bit exposed. But his economy is starting to inflate. It's still an eight-point lead for GUA on the eco count. But look what he's starting to do. Give you anxiety. Understands the fragile balance. He understands how hard it is for anyone to convert to farmlands on King of the Hill. Because the wood lines that you initially start with aren't good enough to float that economy to transition, right? So instead, he has to play risky under the berry bushes, which you want to be doing as France anyway. But after you lose that fight in David Kim's base, this is the most dangerous point in the game to make that choice. But make it nonetheless, he will. And he's going to be punished for it. He's found on the boar. That's going to be so many dead villagers. He's going to try and run away. David starts to focus fire onto them. We'll get rid of one, maybe two of them. But the rest will get away. And they really didn't get their value either. Only 300 food extracted from that boar. 
This really was a recent expansion for GUA. And this is where David understands his opponent is getting a little bit too greedy. But look at this sneak! Okay. <laughs> Pocket economies. I talk about them a lot. Usually they're done around your side of the map. This... This is a sneaky snake maneuver, though. David is so paranoid. He's looking towards the front of his base. Meanwhile, Jiwei, just like a parasite on his underside. He's like, um, num, 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 num. Eventually, David might come down here looking for this food, and he won't get it. In the meantime, he's been butchered. Oh, no. Oh, that. That is a fatal error from David. David, because he postured the Zhugnu army, he will at least butcher villages in return. But he didn't get the walls up. He didn't wait for the walls to go up. And it means he has to cancel off the wood line. And this is going to cripple David. The only upside is he might discover the expansion of the south. The downside, however, is there's an outpost there defending it. So this is about to get very frustrating for David. More Zhugnu coming in. And I think this is where it might just turn into a ram rush at this rate. It's really the only play you got. He's going to move through. Oh, my God. Conscription is underway in China. One gun to three people. Let's go. 48 shoot new. Oh my god, the damage! This is ridiculously effective. I, 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 but, but, why? How do arrows work against buildings? I, you, you don't need a ram, folks. You really don't need a ram. That's 50 shoot new. Free burst. That's 150 damage per round of attack. Holy crap. And now the butchering continues. I don't think GA can do this anymore. I don't think he was ready for this. We weren't ready for this. I think someone's going to have to go hug their mum after this one. Because this, I mean, this leaves a scar on your mind. This is absurd. This is a ranged unit. This isn't meant to be able to burst through buildings. And infantry alike. Oh, my God. Shoot, no. 1.25 seconds. You compare that to the 1.5 of the archers in conjunction with the three attacks versus the one. And remember, the damage on an attack can only be reduced down to one. That means it's doing three times the damage on each round of attacks, and it's doing it quicker than the archers. Ah, oh, this is just absurd. This is trivial. I mean, I thought we were past this. Knights are going to ride in. They have to fight now. David, start steps back, taking a lot of damage for the moment. A lot of the Knights didn't get their Lancers out by the looks of it, so he didn't get the maximized damage for the three seconds after the charge. And this star step back. I, I don't know if it's good enough this time. That's 10 of the Zhugnu already gone. A decent amount of the Knights left, but they're quickly starting to fall as they get branched off onto stragglers. They're not on top of the main battalion. And this trade is going to be pricey on both sides. David still with a decent, healthy number of Zhugnu, but not for long. Too many Knights remain. And David, while he tries to retreat, knows that if any point he just turns and runs, he's going to be butchered. However, I think he thinks this game is done. I mean, you look at his eco right now. David, he just got the bad news. He'll burn through the southern expansion. But the problem is G Wei, because he takes the fight in the center, he can now march forward straight into China's base and plant a French flag and place it as a new colony. <laughs> I mean, the villagers, they'll still get butchered. But they say Viva la France as they flop to the floor. David, it's an unorthodox strategy. It took us by surprise. We almost had a heart attack and fainted from it. But in the end, it's going to be him with a diagnosis death as he will go down and under. And France will continue to reign supreme on King of the Hill.